Between 1830 and 1962, France undertook a military occupation of Algeria. At the time, Algeria was a country whose indigenous population was more or less entirely Muslim. The 130 years of occupation were characterized by two especially violent periods. First, there was the initial conquest of Algeria. This was gradually accomplished between 1830 and 1875. Second, there was the Algerian War of Independence, which ended the French occupation. This took place between 1954 to 1962. During the occupation, French rule resulted in millions of indigenous Muslim deaths. The exact number of deaths is a debated issue. Western academics estimate a death toll of approximately 2 million. On the other hand, Algerian scholars and government officials estimate a death toll of 5 to 10 million. Algerians claim that 5,600,000 people died as a consequence of the French occupation. The occupation of Algeria is a vast and complex topic which cannot be covered in just one episode. This episode will concentrate on the initial French conquest of Algeria between 1830 and 1875. Prior to the French conquest, the indigenous Muslim population of Algeria was 3 to 4 million. During the conquest, Algeria lost one third to one half of its indigenous population. The most authoritative scholarship holds that about 800,000 Muslims were killed by direct French violence. Moreover, a similar number died as a result of famine, epidemic, and economic collapse triggered by the French occupation. In sum, well over a million Muslims died during the initial French conquest. However, the French conquest is not only significant because of the death toll it produced, it's also significant because it exemplifies violent policies that Western governments have used over the past two centuries whenever they have invaded and militarily occupied Muslim lands. Although the French played an important role in pioneering these policies, similar policies have been employed by the British, Dutch and American governments. It's noteworthy that all of these governments are liberal governments. Indeed, France, the UK, the Netherlands and the US are seen as the most perfect and influential real world models of liberal governance. Today, liberal governments champion what they refer to as international development. The concept of development is complex. One component of development includes progress in technology and economic output. However, development has another component which involves progress in the realm of morality. Alleged progress in morality involves restructuring human societies to make them more free, equal and humane through the establishment of new human rights. In this way, development involves establishing rights to religious freedom, women's rights, children's rights, and the abolition of corporal punishment and the death penalty. Liberal Western countries are regarded as the most developed countries because they are the most progressive when it comes to morality. They have established the broadest array of human rights with a clear conscience and a strong heart. Coalition forces have begun striking in Iraq. I want to talk to you about Syria. Blessing to the Iraqi people. Value of freedom. Humanitarian effort, democracy. Humanity. Freedom. Progress. Progress. Today, liberal Western countries believe they have a moral mission 
to promote development and progress and human rights in other less developed countries, including Muslim countries. We have heard that a half a million children have died. You know, is the price worth it? The price, we think the price is worth it. This type of thinking, however, is not new. Rather, it's characterized liberal Western countries for more than two centuries. During the 19th century, liberal Western countries had all these same ideas. They believed that they had a moral obligation to spread development and human rights across the world. At that time, however, they usually referred to development and human rights as, quote, civilizational progress. For instance, 19th century France asserted that it had a moral obligation to spread civilizational progress across the world as part of a civilizing mission. During the 19th century, it was recognized that Western ideas about human rights conflicted with religious and cultural traditions found in non-Western lands. More specifically, it was recognized that establishing human rights in non-Western lands would require destroying all non-Western religious and cultural traditions. It was expected that non-Westerners would resist this process. Liberal Western countries held that it was necessary to use violence in order to force non-Westerners to accept human rights. This would require the invasion and military occupation of non-Western lands. With this in mind, Western countries invaded non-Western lands across the globe, including Muslim lands. It's important to emphasize that such actions were not seen as contrary to liberalism and human rights. Rather, they were justified as liberal efforts to spread development and human rights. Such justifications were set forth by leading 19th century liberal intellectuals and politicians like John Stuart Mill and Alexis de Tocqueville. Liberal Western countries also wanted to benefit financially through their invasions and military occupations. For example, they desired to take economic resources and land from non-Western peoples. The fact that Western countries wanted to benefit financially does not mean that they were not also genuinely committed to spreading human rights and progress. Rather, similar to Western countries today, Western countries in the 19th century sought to both spread human rights and also advance their material financial interests. During the 19th century, liberal intellectuals and politicians in France observed that Algeria was an undeveloped country lacking in human rights. More specifically, the French noted that Algerians had an Islamic Sharia-based legal system whose rules sanctioned many human rights violations, including corporal punishment, infringement upon religious liberty, and violations of so-called women's rights. France recognized that Algerians would not willingly renounce Islam and its laws. France would need to force Algerians to abandon the Sharia and adopt a French-style legal system centered on human rights. France also desired to take control of Algeria's agricultural lands. It planned to use the indigenous Muslim population to undertake low-status labor. Algerians would be allowed to work as farm laborers, servants, and prostitutes for French colonists. So France embarked on a conquest of Algeria, both to spread human rights and to advance its economic interests. As expected, French efforts to conquer Algeria and eliminate the Sharia were immediately met with violent resistance. The Islamic doctrine of jihad teaches that it is religiously meritorious for Muslims to defend their religion, their families, and their land from foreign invaders. In keeping with this doctrine, the Algerians described their resistance to French invasion as a jihad. The Algerian jihad was headed by Abdelkader al-Jazairi. 
Abdul Qadir was both a religious scholar and a highly effective military leader. The doctrine of jihad enraged the French precisely because it was used to justify the resistance to liberal French rule. The French conquest of Algeria was led by General Thomas Robert Bougeot. Bougeot was responsible for crushing the resistance campaign waged by Abdel Qadir. The ferocity of the Algerian resistance surprised the French and they took increasingly harsh measures to counter it. For Bougeot, the project of spreading human rights and advancing French interests justified extreme violence. Bougeot gained notoriety for pursuing a strategy of total war, wherein he burnt down crops, burnt down villages, seized agricultural animals, massacred women and children, and treated resistance groups with total extermination. Moreover, regardless of standard military regulations, Bougeot in practice regularly permitted his soldiers to engage in torture and rape. Bougeot's soldiers were infamous for mutilating the bodies of Muslims, cutting off their ears and displaying their decapitated heads. Bougeot's policies would come to characterize the 130-year French occupation. Hence, this occupation not only resulted in millions of deaths, but also countless incidents of torture and rape. Bougeot recognized that in order to subjugate Muslims, direct killings were not the only tool, or even the best tool. Rather, it was necessary to cause a general economic collapse. Destroying Muslims' food supplies, homes, and businesses while turning them into refugees without the means to survive. By intentionally bringing about an economic collapse, Bougeot ensured that famines and epidemics would claim countless Muslim lives. During the initial French conquest, 800,000 Muslims were killed by direct violence, while a similar number were killed indirectly by famines and epidemics. In 1842, the official French periodical, Moniteur Algérien, published an article from an officer in Bougeot's African army. The officer commented on Bougeot's tactics for crushing Algerian resistance. We have found a more efficient way than burning crops, namely waging an incessant war which impacts the population through individuals and in all their interests. The flights, the continuous alarms, the enormous losses inflicted by the razzias, and even more relocations. The women and children we captured, the old, the women and children, and the herds who perished from fatigue and hunger. The necessity to live the entire winter in the harshest mountains on summits covered with snow. That is what, for better or worse, pushed the Arabs into submission. French liberal intellectuals, politicians, and military officers recognized that Bougeot's tactics seemed to conflict with human rights norms. Nevertheless, the French legitimated these tactics by invoking a specific principle, namely the principle of the ends justify the means. In other words, the French had particular ends or aims these ends included bringing development and human rights to Algeria. In order to achieve these ends, extreme violence was necessary. Thus, France ends justified the means of extreme violence. Addressing the French parliament in 1840, Bougeot defended his tactics, emphasizing the principle of the ends justifying the means. These murmurs would seem to tell me that the parliament chamber find this means of waging war too barbarous. Gentlemen, one does not make war with philanthropic sentiments. When one wants the end, one must want the means. When there are no other means than those I have indicated, it's necessary to employ them. One of the most infamous figures involved in Bougeot's conquest of Algeria 
was Lieutenant Colonel Lucien Francois de Montagnac, who partook in numerous massacres. Montagnac justifies his behavior based on the principle that ends justify the means. Hence, writing in 1843, he states, quote, He who wants the end wants the means. In my opinion, all populations of Algeria who do not accept our conditions must be raised. Everything must be taken, ransacked, regardless of age or sex. The grass should no longer grow where the French army sets foot. Elsewhere, Montagnac adds, quote, Behold, my good friend, how it's necessary to make war on the Arabs. Kill all men till the age of 15, take all the women and children, put them on boats and send them to the Marquesas Islands or elsewhere. In a word, annihilate all who will not crawl at our feet like dogs. Notably, Bougeot's general tactics were endorsed by Alexis de Tocqueville. Tocqueville is one of the most famous liberal intellectuals in history. He was a member of France's parliament and was its foremost expert on Algeria. Tocqueville played a central role in directing French policy in Algeria. Similar to other 19th century liberals, Tocqueville firmly believed that Western countries should invade and militarily occupy non-Western lands. He endorsed Bougeot's tactics as appropriate and necessary. Writing in 1841, Tocqueville defends Bougeot's tactics as follows. I have often heard men in France who I respect, but whom I do not approve, find it wrong that we burn harvests, that we empty silos, and finally that we seize unarmed men, women, and children. These are, according to me, unfortunate necessities, but ones to which any people who want to make war on Arabs is obliged to submit. And if it's necessary to speak my thoughts, these acts do not cause me more revulsion, nor even as much revulsion as many others that the law of war obviously authorizes and which take place in all the wars of Europe. I believe that the law of war authorizes us to ravage the country and that we must do that either by destroying the harvests at harvesting time or at all times by making these rapid incursions that one calls razias and whose object is to seize men and herds. Writing in 1846, Tocqueville states, Once we have condoned the great violence that is conquest, I believe that we must not shrink from the smaller violences which are absolutely necessary to consolidate it. The French conquest of Algeria offers some important lessons. First, the pre-modern Islamic notion of jihad is complex. There are different types of jihad. Some jihads are waged to conquer non-Muslim lands. Other jihads are waged to defend Muslim lands from foreign invasions. During the last three centuries, more or less, every jihad has been defensive in nature. Contemporary Westerners are not enraged by the concept of jihad because Muslims are invoking it to justify the conquest of Western lands. Rather, Westerners and liberals are enraged by the concept of jihad because Muslims have invoked it to justify defense against genocidal Western aggression. Algeria is an instructive case. Algeria posed no military threat to France. Rather, France invaded Algeria. The French invasion resulted in a defensive jihad. Moreover, the French were perfectly aware their invasion would produce this exact result. Nevertheless, they consciously decided to transform Algeria into a bloody realm of mass death, economic devastation, and jihad-related violence. Admittedly, some of this death, devastation, and violence might have been avoided if the Algerians simply allowed the French to destroy their religion, take control of their lands, and attack their families. The Algerians could have willingly accepted the low-status roles that the French designated for them, working under French masters as laborers, servants, and prostitutes. Yet accepting such things is not easy for people with dignity and honor, like the Muslim Algerians. 
More generally, we may say that because liberal ideology justifies the invasion of Muslim lands in the name of human rights, liberal ideology transforms Muslim lands into bloody realms of mass death, economic devastation, and jihad-related violence. This is true whether we're talking about France and Algeria, or the more recent US invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan as part of the recent so-called global war on terror. Nevertheless, liberal propaganda conceals this obvious fact. For the liberal propagandists, the destruction of Algeria or Iraq or Afghanistan is adequately explained by verses in the Quran which endorse jihad. Put differently, the indigenous populations in these lands read the Quran and then they decided to destroy their own societies by implementing Quranic teachings on jihad. A second lesson offered by the French conquest of Algeria pertains to strategies for subjugating Muslims. These strategies are not limited to direct killing, rather they depend largely or primarily on causing economic collapses, famines, epidemics, and waves of refugees. These generate immense suffering and result in countless indirect deaths. Over the past 200 years, liberal Western states have continuously used such tactics against Muslims, and they continue to be used into the present. Consider recent U.S. policies characteristic of the global war on terror. During the past two decades, such policies have produced political and economic collapses in numerous Muslim countries, including Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and Libya. These collapses have resulted in several million indirect deaths, as well as 38 million refugees. U.S. forces have also directly killed hundreds of thousands of Muslims, yet these direct deaths are only a small part of the overall picture. A third lesson is that liberal Western views on human rights are more complex than they initially appear. At first glance, it seems that human rights norms prohibit the invasion and violent occupation of other countries. Human rights norms would also seem to prohibit killing millions of people and engaging in behaviors like torture and rape. Yet this is a simplistic and historically inaccurate understanding of liberal human rights. Over the past two centuries, liberal intellectuals and politicians have continually endorsed the view that efforts to spread human rights justify behaviors which seem to violate human rights, including military invasions, massacres, as well as mass torture and mass rape. For liberals, the ends justify the means, so spreading human rights justifies various forms of extreme violence. Muslims have been a primary target of such violence. French rule in Algeria is one example, but there are many others. These include Dutch rule in Indonesia, British rule in India, Russian rule in the Caucasus, and US rule in Iraq and Afghanistan. In this sense, liberal human rights activism has a genocidal dimension. To be sure, such a view conflicts with liberal human rights propaganda. According to such propaganda, true human rights activism does not produce genocide, let alone mass torture and rape. This is similar to propaganda from Christians, for example, or communists. Such propaganda asserts that true Christianity or true communism does not produce genocide. What is clear, however, is that individuals claiming to act in the name of Christianity and communism have produced numerous genocides. The same applies to liberal human rights activists and liberal human rights philosophers and thinkers. The human rights activist, the communist, and Christian are the same in the sense that they will never acknowledge the mass violence they worked against others. Judged in terms of statistics, these groups have perpetrated the largest genocides in history. Nevertheless, these groups deny all responsibility. At the same time, these groups continuously and obsessively condemn the violence they attribute to others, like Muslims. The point here is not to endorse the childish, naive view that all violence is wrong. Rather, it is to highlight the unprincipled and deceptive character of liberal discourse, which has these parallels in communist and Christian discourse.